Welcome back to our podcast on solid ground. My name is Joe Boyle, and I'm the social media specialist here at Helicon. I'm joined with our CEO, Jay Silver, as well as our guest, Colt Hollander. Uh, Cole, what, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, I'm from the North Central Florida area. Been in the uh, chemical grouting industry for uh, about 15 years now. Come from the contracting side of the world, you know, actually doing the installs. I did that for about 12 years. Um, now we're kind of upgraded to the manufacturer. Um, so now I do a lot of training. Um, installing crews or helping the crews install, um, teaching them, you know, the proper way to use these grouts and, you know, get the job done correctly. Very nice. Well, we're glad you're here. Uh, what is the importance of a seawall and what purpose does it serve? To me, if you have waterfront property, um, a seawall is the single most important structure on that property. It protects everything from your assets to your property. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's there for the day-to-day -day activities of weather, tidal movement, and it can, it's also there to protect you from, you know, the curveball Mother Nature can throw at us. Right. Yeah, exactly. it's, uh, it's hard, hard to believe that uh, Helicon, uh, I've been doing this now 19 years, uh, helping homeowners, businesses, um, anybody with any soil issues, mm -hmm. challenges, doing foundation repair and soil stabilization. And about, uh, about three years ago, we got into doing soil stabilization behind seawalls. So excited to have uh, Colt here with the Seawall Repair Network. He's a uh, plethora of knowledge and experience. So uh, excited to share some of that uh, here today with our, our audience on how we're now not just doing sinkholes, doing ground improvement for new construction, new buildings, but now we're doing it uh, with the seawall repair network uh, behind seawalls as well. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> so what does the process look like for regaining soil stabilization behind a seawall and permanently stopping erosion, depressions, voids, washout, soil instability? So the process itself is actually it's it's a tried and true process. We've you know we've been performing this nationwide for quite a while now, and even back when I was installing, it was you know it was something that you know we started and we actually seen the you know seen the benefits of it throughout hurricanes and storms that we've had. You know we've had walls fell adjacent to the properties we've done and ours held true. Um, but that process is you know one of the beauties of it is how non-invasive it is, how quickly it can be achieved. Um, and, and like I said, just, I can't stress to you enough how, how non-invasive it is and to the point it is. You know, typically when the crew will show up, um, you know, they start by, you know, evaluating the, the, the site, seeing exactly what they have to do, because every seawall is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And, you know, each job we have to cater to those needs for that wall. Um, but the process is, is simply the crew will, they'll put a half inch ejection rod down to a certain depth. Um, you know, typically we start about a foot below the mud line um, so we can get the entire strata of behind that wall and we'll start injecting at a rate of about a gallon per vertical foot roughly mm -hmm. You know, sometimes that changes if the erosion is worse if it's you know, not as bad, you know, that rate will change a little bit um, And then they'll basically like I said pump at a gallon per vertical foot until they're all the way up to the surface And what that's going to do is the product that we actually inject is it's a moisture activated polyurethane um, And what that product does is it slowly starts to expand and push itself into the surrounding soils and voids to stabilize that soil, to fill any voids that's there, and in the process, it also helps push itself into the or push itself into cracks, any seams in the wall where that erosion is actually taking place. So it, it permanently seals the wall, permanently stabilizes the soil behind it, and fills any voids you know that may be there. So, like like I said, it's it it's kind of an all-in-one product when you think about it if it's installed correctly. Um, but it's you know that that's that's that, that's its main purpose. But it's actually a two-step process, in my opinion. So that's that's that would be the first step of what the crew does, and the second step is, you know, once you get the walls sealed up, you have to address the hydrostatic pressure that's now built up behind these walls, and um, that step is also pretty non-invasive. You know, that's typically a crew getting on the water side of the wall, and we'll core holes in the wall and we'll install panel ports, jet filters, that um, basically allow all that hydrostatic pressure to drain. Now, now that you have the wall sealed up and it can't drain, you know, through cracks and crevices. It allows that water to drain naturally through those panel ports right where we want it to, and it holds all the soil back while it does while it's draining, you know, draining the, the hydrostatic pressure. Wow. Yeah, once the, the wall is sealed up, uh, water weighs about seven, roughly, depending on salt water or fresh water, weighs about seven pounds per gallon, and it's it's relentless. So you have thousands of gallons of water that needs to be released. So you're talking tons and tons of pressure being exerted against the wall. And if uh, once we seal up all the cracks and crevices, and as Colt was mentioning on 
whether it's a wooden seawall, a concrete seawall, we'll actually see the product uh, seep through on the other side through these cracks and crevices. And we have a protection net set up and our guys are scooping it out of the water. Um, but also for our audience to know the product is completely green friendly. Um, Colt and others say you could drink it. I've, I've never been that, uh, <laughs> that adventurous uh, to try yeah, to drink right. the product, yeah, um, but it is good to know it is environmentally friendly. It's not going to hurt any of the fish or any of the wildlife. Um, and we also do scoop it uh, out as well. But the, the jet filter, um, the reason why Helicon uh, requires that and the seawall repair network on every single job is if we're going to stamp and seal our, our uh, name on the project, we want to be certain we're using the best pressure relief valve system in the market. And we feel the patented jet filter system achieves that for many different reasons. Uh, Cole will probably go into some details, but one for me it, it, if it does clog, it's one of the, uh, you know, I don't know if it's the only one cold that is fully uh, maintainable and serviceable. And uh, a lot of homeowners will ask me, you know, is this something that I have to hire somebody to come out to service? And I show them how easy it is. Most of the time, you don't even need to get into the water if you're able to reach it uh, from the seawall side. Uh, but it just pops out. You pull it out with a needle nose pliers rinse it off, make sure the, the filter fabric inside the jet filter is not uh, broken or, or still intact, and you pop it back in, probably takes about 10 seconds, five, 10, 15 seconds of jet filter, and right. homeowners can fully maintain it on their own. Um, you know, one question that I'm sure audience members, you talked about the process, Colt. Um, to give them an idea, you know, average, I'd say average seawalls are about 100 linear feet. That's right. What, what does a typical timeline look for a homeowner? Uh, you mentioned how non-invasive it is. That's right. Um, much more non-invasive than if you've ever had to deal with ripping out and oh, replacing mm -hmm. a seawall. But right. just to give our audience an idea, 100 foot linear uh, foot seawall, um, you know, general height, how long does that, that process stay, take from the time we start to the time it's finished? And then the the last phase of the jet filters, typically how long would that take on that size wall? So your typical install um, is going to take about a day, day and a half for, a, let's say, for an 80 to 100 foot wall. That's what most properties are here in Florida. They're, top, you know, roughly 80 to 100 feet um, of, of seawall. That's going to take about a day, day and a yeah. half to do the install of the, the, actual, the actual grout itself. Um, and then we typically follow up. Uh, the next day we'll come in or shortly thereafter we'll come in and actually install install the uh, jet filters themselves and that typically takes about a day that part is a little tide dependent um you do have to play the tides a little bit with that um but that's pretty much the quickest part of the process is the, the install of the jet filters Very nice. yeah if the tides down low the process goes faster and, and joe and i witnessed that on yeah. a few sites uh when it is tight high tide still can be done but the the installer is having to do that underneath the water, which is a little more more challenging yeah, than when you're <laughs> you're uh, up above the water. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> it is. And then you know, like I said, back when 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 I was actually installing, and and it's all cosmetic. So when the water's high, it's hard to get them straight. So we try to do it on a on a falling tide, you know. But it's still yeah. a pretty quick install. And in general, um, where are they installing the jet filter above the uh, the water line or the barnacle line? How, how high up? So if, if you're in a tide dependent area where you have tide fluctuation, you want to be at that mean mark. Um, typically the algae will point that mark out for you. Um, mm -hmm. And we go just a couple inches above that to try to keep marine growth off those filters. Um, mm -hmm. It's still going to happen. You're still going to get some marine growth, but you know, we recommend servicing these filters, you know, at least annually. So at that point, you know, there's not going to be that much growth on them, but that's typically where you want your placement is right above that mean tide mark. So right above your oyster line, barnacle line, and if you're on freshwater where the tide doesn't fluctuate too, or there is no tide, <laughs> um, where the water doesn't fluctuate, you still, you want to be as close to that water mark as possible because, and the whole purpose of that is to drain as much hydrostatic pressure off that wall as possible. And the lower you put that filter, the more pressure you're going to be able to relieve. So that's, that's pretty much the, the placement. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So what happens if another void appears behind the wall after the soil stabilization is finished? Can you give like a more explanation to that? So, uh, you know, w one thing with this process you'll see that stands out from new construction is the warranty. Mm -hmm. The warranty on this process is, you know, industry leading. And that warranty is in place for just situations just like that. When these crews show up, you know, we're going to do our best to get every single void that may be there. 
Um, but the main thing we're after is to seal up any cracks, any seams in the wall to make sure that, you know, there is no future erosion. Sometimes we miss a void, you know, we can't see exactly what's down there. If there's something four foot down, it's hard for us to see it or know it. And most of the time, 99% of the time that we get a call back, it's due to one of those older voids collapsing. It's not, not so much because, you know, the erosion is still continuing. Now, there is the case where we may miss, miss a spot or something like that, but 90% of the time it's from, a, you know, a previous void that's collapsed and now the homeowner can see it. So in that situation, we would, you know, we would still probably re-inject that area um, just to make sure we've got it, you know, as a precautionary thing. Um, and then, you know, grade out the, the, you know, the, the, the landward side just so. So it's all yeah. buttoned up. Yeah. Yeah. In our yeah. experience, Joe, we, we do have from time to time a, a small spot that may open up. Um, the homeowner will, homeowner will reach out or business uh, to Helicon. will open up a case and get our service team to come out and typically re-spot treat uh, that one area, which is under the warranty at no cost uh, to the client. Very nice. Very nice. So can you explain the domino effect and how it begins with soil instability, but maybe can evolve into something more if it's left untreated? I think I can't stress how real the domino effect is in in the seawall industry, because it 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 you know it all starts with erosion, and, and I've seen walls that's less than a year old, and that's and, and they're eroding like crazy, and it's it's it goes so much farther than just that than just erosion, because what ends up happening is as that soil erodes directly behind the wall, soil further back starts to migrate forward, and when that happens. You know, the next thing that fails is your dead man anchor. If you have dead man or tieback, you know, whatever your anchoring system may be, now the soil that's around those anchors have lost their stability, you know, and everything starts to migrate forward. And it, and it's, it is a domino effect. So once the erosion starts and then the tiebacks or dead man's will start to pull forward, now the wall will start to overturn or kick out. And it, you know, from then on, then you get cracks in the cap, cracks in the panels. Um, and then that leads to spalding. So now, now your you know your cap spalding due to the stress that was put on it because your tiebacks failed, um, and it all spawned from the erosion of the wall. So it, it truly is a domino effect, and it, it's it's incredibly important to keep an eye on this stuff because you can take a very simple repair. And it can get you know incredibly in depth you know over a year or two if it's not you know if you don't if you don't look out for these things. Right. And to uh to add to that, to, to compound uh, the domino effect, if the pressure relief valve system also fails in congruent with soil instability, you know, then, then watch out because now you have weakened uh, dead man mm -hmm. anchoring system paired by no pressure relief and all of that thousands and tons of pounds of water exerting force onto the wall causes that kick out at the bottom or the top uh, that Cole, yeah, Cole is mentioning. Yeah, definitely. And then uh, for our audience that uh, isn't um, as experienced with spalding, could you maybe explain a little of that of how yeah. that weakens the wall? And that is kind of one of those dominoes, you have the soil instability, the dead man, the pressure relief valve system. And then once shifts and cracks happen, then spalding starts to take over. And what, what can happen from, from that point? You know, spalding um, is something that, it, man, once it starts, you have got to get a grasp on it. And typically, so, so what it is, is when, you know, the basic construction of a seawall, whether it's a vinyl, steel, concrete, even some wood, not so much wood, but some woods do have a concrete cap on them. That concrete cap is not just for you to walk on. It's there to hold that wall together. That's what's holding all these individual piles or panels all in line, all together, ties it all together. And what, in, what ends up happening is as that cap starts to crack due to movement, um, water can leach in and, and actually reach the steel of the cap. And once that water reaches the steel, that steel starts to corrode. And if you're familiar with corrosion, and if you're not, what well, the first thing that happens when steel corrodes is it expands. You put something expanding inside of a, a very mm -hmm. rigid, you know, material like concrete, and it, it literally starts to, you know, in lack of a better word, it starts to explode from the inside out. I mean, it, it, it will just absolutely des destroy a cap from the inside out. So spalding is one of the things that causes a ton of damage if it's left untreated. And, and there is ways to treat it and, you know, to stop it in its tracks. But it, the, the key is catching it. Wow. So for those homeowners or, or business owners watching and they're like, oh, my gosh, I've got the soil instability. It's starting to expose my dead man. The wall has shifted. I'm getting some cracks, maybe some light rusting. What, what should they do to prevent having to replace that at that point? 
So in, for Spalding, to how to prevent it, I guess would be, um, you know, once it's started and that crack is there, um, th that crack has got to be sealed. And in my opinion, more than just in a way of something you can get from your, your box store, you know, your Lowe's or Home Depot, there is structural ways to repair these cracks where, you know, you know, concrete is constantly expanding and contracting. And there's products out there that can that can handle that expanding and contracting, but it also fixes those cracks and, and you know, shuts down the spalding pretty much immediately. Okay. And how often should a seawall be checked or evaluated for like homeowners to know? I say annually, annually? I, you know, annually. And look, you know, if you're a homeowner, you're out there a lot more than annually. Um, you know, just whenever you see something, if you see, you know, rust running down the cap, if you see, you know, depressions in the backyard, you, you know, you need to pay attention to those things. And, you know, even if you, you know, call for a site evaluation, have an expert come in, you know, like Helicon to, to actually see what the problem is and, you know, try to, you know, try to stop it in its tracks before, it, you know, progresses into something much more. Yeah, exactly. And more costly. And more yeah. costly. And more costly. <laughs> that's where we're going to start to hopefully uh, share with Donna about replacement and, and the different right. costs uh, yep. involved and timeline and the, the impact in their, their just normal uh, daily life That's right. that, that happens. Definitely. <clears throat> so what are some pre-existing structural element problems that soil, that soil stabilization will not fix and how do you prevent them from happening? Obviously, if your tie backs, dead man have already started to shift. If the tie rods have already broke, Essentially, a tie rod is what connects the cap to the dead men. If those have already broke, you know, soil sta stabilizing the soil and stopping the erosion is not going to fix that problem. Um, the best way to prevent it is to be proactive. Notice these problems from the get-go so we so they can be treated and they can be stopped. Okay. Interesting. So if these elements are present, should you consider replacing the wall altogether or what's the route you, they should take? Until recently, I feel like most homeowners only thought with, with a seawall or bulkhead or, you know, whatever kind of waterfront structure you're dealing with, you know, there hasn't been a tried and true repair method. And rip out and replace was, that was the go-to. They thought that was the only option. Well, the construction industry has evolved and has some amazing products to fix these issues, like in a way of permanently fixing these issues, putting that, you know, structural integrity back into that wall, you know, from, you know, retrofitted anchors, to epoxy injection to stop the um, corrosion of spalding, to polyurethane injection to stop the er you know erosion and the dewatering channels. You know that's that's pretty much you know the it's evolved. There, there's other <laughs> options um, that are that are tried and true, and you know that that's yeah. yeah. And we all know that uh, replacement does have its place, and there are times that's when right. the wall mm -hmm. is. The dominoes have fallen to us to an extent where fixing these things right. does not not make sense. Could you maybe explain to the audience of wh when has the wall gone past the point of no return and it does need to be ripped out and replaced? Right. So um, with anything, there there is a time. You know, nothing lasts forever. But when these walls start to overturn, if let's say you had six inches plus of you know of overturning at the top of the cap or even kick out at the bottom, um, especially with concrete um, precast panel walls. So if you have a concrete, you know, seawall and you see the bottoms kicked out, most of the time those panels are already broken. They're broken at the mud line due to the hydrostatic pressure. Situations like that, you, you know, a repair is not, not your mm -hmm. best option. It's gonna be full replacement in those, you know, cause the way I always look at it is if that wall still has structural integrity, it just has issues. We can we can combat those issues and we can fix them, but if the structural integrity is gone, you know re replacement is really need that, that's really where you need to be looking at. Gotcha. And if the homeowner gets or homeowner or business uh, gets to that point, what what are they looking at as far as timeline, Colt, to get it to get a new wall replaced versus you know you mentioned the other process only taking a, a day day and a half maybe two days to do a hundred foot that's linear right. seawall using that example. If the wall had gotten to a point where it does have to be replaced, what what is the customer looking at as far as cost, timeline, and impact uh, to their usage of that that area during that process? I will tell you, seawall replacement is a 
incredibly invasive process. <laughs> <laughs> Your entire backyard or wherever it's at will be completely unusable. Um, but typically the install process, so once they actually get there and they start to, you know, construct your new wall, whether it's a vinyl wall, if they're driving sheet panels, or if it's a, you know, precast concrete wall, whatever it may be, most of the time they'll drive in front of your old, so they don't, they're don't they not going to be removing your, your, your old wall. They just go in front of it. But still with that, it's still at a minimum, the fastest wall I've ever seen go in was two and a half weeks. And that was, that, that was a crew there that had two excavators there. They had a crane on site. I mean, they were getting after it. Um, but typically what I see from start to finish, from when they break ground in your backyard, it's about a month long process. But that doesn't even touch on the permitting process, mm -hmm. which can be, you get in a high populated mm -hmm. area. EPC. Yeah. I mean, that process alone could take months. And then mm -hmm. most seawall companies out there that are doing replacements, their waiting list is over a year. Wow. I can't speak for all of them, but most of, mostly what I've seen, what I still see, they're anywhere from eight months to a year out before they even start your permitting process. Mm -hmm. So, and at that point, one thing that's always, you know, I always try to stress to people, if you've reached that point where you need a new wall, you need to get on somebody's list ASAP because you're just one storm away from losing your pool. Mm -hmm. Because if, if this thing fails completely, it's not just your wall you got to deal with. It's everything, you know, 20, 30 feet behind it. Because when that wall fails, everything shifts forward. Right. It brings up a, a really great point. And Joe and mm -hmm. I have been told by some of the, our uh, our partners that uh, it could be two to five years yeah, in some that's... of these hurricane affected areas. Now, for a homeowner that is that far out or business two to five years, what should they do in the meantime to to possibly at least be a temporary uh, shoring or or something while that's, they're waiting for two years at least right. to hold soil? Will will the product hold soil back with a a very damaged or, or wall that needs to be replaced so that, that's that's a very tough question because yeah. it's yeah. it's you're for the homeowner you're spending money to prolong just to spend more money mm -hmm. and that's 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 what but what you're saving is you're you're protecting your your you know your mm -hmm. assets which is your home your pool you know your, your property um to, to get that wall replaced now our products we, we we have had you know some situations where the wall the wall is it just all around needs to be replaced but we'll still come in and we'll do the polyurethane. We'll do the resin injection to stop the erosion and we'll put some panel ports in just to buy them time to get them to that, you know, that two year mark, like you said, just so, you know, they can further protect their assets, you know, but. Mm -hmm. Do they at a, least have some, some benefit of that soil stabilization uh, done in that uh, interim period when the new wall goes in? Yeah, yeah. most definitely, uh, uh, you know. So. so one thing about new construction is when they drive in front, of, of, a, of an old wall, you end up with an annular space. And what ends up happening is now I'm not, I don't want to speak for all the, all the, you mm -hmm. know, uh, seawall contractors out there because everybody does it different, but I've seen so many situations where that annular space will be left empty and mm -hmm. that soil will, I mean, now it's on an express lane to fill that annular space. You know, once the new wall is in, everything's said and done, that soul's still trying to migrate to fill that annular space. And, mm -hmm. If you were to go ahead and do the do the resin injection, do this process, you could you could stabilize that soil and stop that migration to that new wall. So there is a benefit to doing it, you know, before your new construction or even after you've had a new construction put in. We've seen a ton of people who still elect to do this process because, like I mentioned before, we've I have been on many sites and I've been called by many seawall companies that just put a brand new wall in and they can't get the erosion under control. And they call us to come in, do the resin injection on a brand new seawall. So it's it's it is a very good pro. I mean, it's a yeah. phenomenal process because of all the everything you gain from it. Because all this spawns from you know soils migrating, and that's one thing that we can shut down. And that probably brings a, a question up for for our audience on that are that have recently put in a new seawall or they're looking to do one. Should I consider doing this soil stabilization behind my brand new seawall? And uh, coupled with that question, you know, I've heard thrown around that seawalls last typically life expectancy is 50 years. You know, I'm a believer. I don't know about you, Colt, but if it's a brand new seawall with this uh, soil stabilization behind the wall, you could be looking at 75 to 100 plus years of life expectancy for these new walls with better materials, better construction. And you most definitely can it is so 
one thing that has changed over time with construction, what I've seen, and this is the biggest aspect, you know, that structure per the Army Corps of Engineers, you know, when they first started developing these walls in Florida, concrete walls I'm speaking to, I'm not speaking to vinyl, um, concrete walls had a life expectancy of 80 to 100 years. That's what they expected that concrete structure to last. And when they were building them back in the day, the, the, you know, the entire backside of the, the wall was layered with filter fabric. I mean, everything was bulletproof on the erosion side of things. Um, this day and age, the wall itself, the material, yes, those have gotten better. But what's gotten worse, in my opinion, is the geostectile, the, or excuse me, the, the filter fabric mm. that they put behind walls to stop erosion. You look at it now, it's they're putting an eight inch strip over the seams mm -hmm. and it's that gets peeled off when they're backfilling half the time. Mm -hmm. So on, if you have a new wall, I would highly suggest one, seeing how the install went in, seeing how the contractor did on the filter fabric. And if it was a six inch sheet, eight inch sheet, then you know chemical grouting is something that you really need to think about doing because this this is this is a permanent solution and this will this will extend that life of that wall to that 80 years that 100 years that they're projected to have where these walls you know fail is when they start to erode when soil migrates when you're you know when your anchoring system fails and they start to crack and spalding starts that's where you take an 80 year wall and now the life expectancy is 30 years if you're lucky wow so this is more of like a technical question, but is the work completed actually considered seawall repair or is it more soil stabilization related? Like, what are your thoughts on that? I think that boils down to how soon the homeowner catches it. You know, if the, if the homeowner is proactive with it, then, you know, sealing the wall, draining it, pretty much all you need. Okay. Um, if, if it's caught at a later date and the problems have per persisted, then it's gonna be kind of both. It's gonna be, you know, you're going to have some seawall repair included with, you know, the soil stabilization, the drainage. That's okay. typically the way I see it. I see. Okay. So going into the jet filters, uh, why are jet filters required within a seawall and what's the importance of a pressure relief valve system? So with us, with our process, you know, that, 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 that we've, you know, put into place, jet filters are required. Unfortunately, new construction, they're not. You know, there, 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 there is no weep hole. There, there is no code saying, you know, that there has to be some kind of drainage. Now, unless something's changed in the past six months, unbeknownst to me, yeah. you know, that there's nothing on new construction saying to properly drain that wall. But I can't stress to you how important that is. You know, I, just a, a quick story. A guy that I know, he had a rain harvesting system. I don't know if, if you're familiar with that. Basically, that takes rainwater from a roof and stores it in a tank. So he had a 20 by 40 barn essentially that he was doing that on. Half inch of rain yielded him a thousand gallons of water. Wow. On okay. that small footprint. So when you turn yeah. that into if when you do that math on a backyard, you're talking hundreds of thousands of gallons, millions of gallons over a rainy season. And that is the importance of draining a wall. You have to let that water get it back into the, you know, you have to let that water drain properly or uh, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. you know. Total failure is just right around the corner. I mean, that, that amount of weight, that amount of pressure, you know, I don't care how good your anchoring system is. Yeah. You can't handle that. But when is, uh, or when is a pressure relief valve system not needed in like what situations? The way I see it, they're always needed. Okay. The, the, the only time I have not put them in on some lakes um, or, yeah. you know, ponds where the water level is, you know, six inches below the cap, there's not the room to put them in. That would be the only situation where I, I, that I haven't put them in just because I couldn't, you know, it wasn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't feasible. There wasn't enough room to put them in. And even at that point, you were only going to be draining six inches of soil, you know? So, so a lot of it depends quote on the, the height of the wall the height so of the wall. A, and whether there's tidal flows. That's right. Um, but if the wall is, yeah, only a one foot or a two foot wall above the lake, water, then that's right. Yeah, but most of the walls we see here, you're gonna, typically going to have six yeah. to eight feet and you get in some areas like speaking for here, Boca Ciega Bay, they have mm -hmm. some of the tallest walls I've ever seen, right. you know, or, you know, or not, not that I've seen, but mm -hmm. for this area, those walls, it's nothing to have 10 or 12 feet above yeah. the water line. That's an immense amount of hydrostatic pressure and draining stuff like that, you know, is, is, it, it's a must. It is a, mm -hmm. a, it is a must. Okay. 
So we were talking about life expectancy of the seawalls earlier. Uh, what's the life expectancy of a typical concrete seawall versus wooden ones, vinyl sheet piles, salt water versus fresh water? Typically what I see are what historical data shows us is if the wall was maintained properly, let's say everything was everything was good with the structure, like I had mentioned, 80 to 100 years is what the Army Corps says for a concrete precast um, sheet panel wall. You get into wood, it backs down to about, 20, about 25 years. Um, some of the new vinyl composites, they're saying 50 years, but it still boils down to how you maintain it. The, you know, these structures are something that have to be maintained. It's not just to put it up and forget it. If you don't maintain them, you're gonna cut those in half, you know, the life expectancy. I see, okay. And as like a little wrap up, what was your most memorable seawall repair project and why? Uh, I would have to say, probably Loggerhead Marina in West Palm Beach. Um, that was a massive marina. It's, it's arguably one of the busiest marinas we did. You know, they're, they're dropping 60 to 80 boats a day. Mm -hmm. And we were able to come in with this process, not shut the marina down. The marina stayed completely active while we, we fulfilled the entire, pro, uh, you know, process. Um, so that, that one, that one to me mm -hmm. was probably, probably one of the coolest jobs I've done. You know, that wall itself was a tank, you know, we're, we're talking something, you know, the panels were three foot thick. The apron was four and a half foot thick. Um, mm -hmm. it was just a beast of a wall that was super high traffic. And we were able to get in there, mm -hmm. not slow the Marina down one bit. And, you know, they were, st they were able to stay completely functional while we did our repair. Um, that, that one to me was a real fun project. Um, I would about, say that was part about of how many linear feet just in ballpark was that a thousand linear feet on that project no, that, or so 500 or i want to yeah. say it was roughly around 600 because it was at the okay. end of okay. a canal yeah. right right at the palm beach inlet um i mean it's it's right there up front and center um but it was a u-shape so there was quite a bit but it was different construction yeah. some of the wall mm -hmm. was sheet panels some was concrete but that was <laughs> a that was a very unique project and we actually tackled it from the water side you know we we actually mm -hmm. drilled through the water side, not oh, going yeah. through the top. Oh. So, you know, the best part about that is, and I always use it as an example because there's there's hundreds of ways for us to get these products where they need to be. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't always, you know, if you have a pool right adjacent to the seawall, we can still make it happen. You know, we can still perform that, you know, process. If you have a fully functional mm -hmm. marina, we can still make it happen. We yeah. can get these products in the ground where they need to be. All right, that wraps up our video. Thanks so much for watching. We also want to thank Colt for joining us today. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel, and we will see you on the next one.